uh, I want to talk about, you know, the uh, kind of talks about ostensive definitions. I, I want to uh, elucidate some problems with uh, regard to ostensive definitions. Uh, uh, firstly, uh, we can start our discussion with what we can, we can, can be called, you know, the semanticization problematic at the beginning of AFMAO. Uh, when Karnap says, you know, a scientific statement makes sense only if the meaning of the object names which contains can be indicated. Here, I think, you know, meaning of semanticization takes the center stage of our problematic. Uh, and there's, there are basically two ways of doing this, Karnap tells, tells us. Uh, the first of these is through a sense of different Definitions. And he says uh, an object is brought within the range of perception and then is indicated by appropriate gesture or bodily maneuvering or any kind of corporeal or bodily manipulation. The second, he says, you know, consists of different descriptions. Different descriptions, he says, do not need, you know, to enumerate all the essential characteristics, but only many properties as required to recognize the object clearly as, as an extensional or referential properties of those, I think that's what he says. He says, you know, this kind of extensionalism about properties uh, is ultimately is semantic, but this semantic desiderata, this semantic aim of ours should be ultimately, you know, desemanticized. I think that's what he says. Uh, it should be desemanticized because, you know, uh, what we want in the final analysis is uh, the formal or relational properties between objects, not the uh, meaningful or semantic uh, properties of, of descriptions. Uh, so, making this kind of this, this distinction between ostensive definitions and this different descriptions, uh, kind, kind of ultimately says, you know, we don't need ostensive definitions since our aim of, you know, is the construction or structural characterization. We can carry out this task purely based on different descriptions that are purely structural, namely the descriptions that stay within the limits of purely structural statements. Uh, but I, I want to argue, you know, ultimately, Karnap does not make any distinction between ostension proper and ostensive, ostensive definitions. You know, I think he does not, he does not talk about ostension at all. Uh, as far as the first, chap uh, the first chapter of the book is concerned, I don't know about the rest of the book, but as far as the first chapter of the book is concerned, he does not talk about ostension proper. And I think ostension proper can be powerfully be used in the whole about project. Uh, I'll discuss in the next slide. Uh, uh, the difference between ostens ostension proper and ostensive definition is that ostension, as opposed to ostensive definitions, is purely an embedded action. You know, it's not a linguistic or conceptual act. Here, I want I will I want to define you know concept use and language use as the same kind of activities in the broadest possible sense. Uh, and I want to argue, you know, ostensive acts. Uh, result in some kind of structural difference or differentiation or structuration of the environment without being ostensive definitions or conceptual descriptions. Uh, paradigmatic examples of uh, ostension would be, you know, pointing at something or gazing at something or gesturing on something. Uh, and these kind of ostensive acts, you know, classify a pattern of action that are specified by our, our embedded doing that sets, sets the stage for further actions. Uh, when you know when ostension is carried out, the result why we, the reason why we are involved in this kind of ostensive acts is that when the quantity of environmental you know, bombardment proves too much to be receptively taken as a qualitative whole or as a complete picture, what ostension does, you know, as Karab says, you know, because of its entangled continuous entangled relationship with perception, is to classify the environment into relatively discrete and stable units. But this classification of the environment into relatively stable units or discrete units is, is carried out in a non-propositional or non-conceptual or non-logical way. So basically, ostension carves the environment at its joints. But this carving of the environment at its joints is not a conceptual or logical activity. It does not require any previous or prior definitions or descriptions. You know, I want to talk about the example that's shown in the, in the slide. You know, for, consider the example of, you know, pointing at one's finger at a particular region of the environment or gazing in a particular section of the environment. What we do when you are engaged in these kind of activities is to initiate a series of sensory motor active machinery that allows us to direct 
one's finger, our finger, or gaze uh, into a particular region of the environment. Hence, the environment becomes a particular, uh, this particular region of the environment becomes dif a differentiated segment, you know, a structural segment, a structural part that's ready for us to do so all sorts of things with it. You know, uh, consider this example, you know, uh, person A, you know, shouts to person B, hey, yo, there's an incoming ball third, third you. Person A wants to warn person B to dodge the incoming ball. So what person A does is to, you know, what, I, what person B does is to, you know, optimally prognosticate the spatial tra tra trajectory with expedient, with, with expedient bodily maneuvering and subsequently avoiding the approaching ball. You know, the corporeal or bodily manipulation or bodily maneuvering is achieved by, you know, by moving a few steps back or flexing one's neck or jumping or catching the ball. One is able to dodge the, the imminent threat. However, this specific prognostication powers of corporeal manu maneuvering or bodily manipulation contains no concept of dodging or neck flexion or concept of gazing or concept of gesturing. The, env the environment now is structured for person B into a relatively distinct units, you know, contain, con that contains the ball, the noise that accompanies the ball, and so on and so forth. The final outcome for person B is that he employs all kinds of relationships that establish a connection between his location with a relation of his, of his body with the incoming ball, the body maneuvering, so the final outcome for person B is you know, an inactive structuration that's achieved for him completely irrespective of what kind of conceptual or lo logical concept that he has. Uh, Carnap says, you know, uh, you know at, at, what, at one point that relations form the starting point of the whole constructional, constructional system. So I think this kind of inactively structured structural relationship can be the basis of uh, construction more than you know sense impressions or primary experiences that empresses talk about. Uh, I want to uh, in the next slide. I want to talk about this, the distinction between uh, ostension and sense impression. Sense impressions. Uh, you know, uh, there are certain features of ostensions that makes makes it fundamentally different from sense impressions or primary experiences of the empiricists. Uh, the first is that you know ostension is not merely a causal happening as Carnap says, but it's a normative act. This particular sense of normativity is what counts as you know a correct or incorrect mode of action. In our example, you know first when person B moves a few steps back or flexes his neck or jumps or casts the ball, this kind of action can be characterized as correct or incorrect. Hence, it's a normative act. It's not a purely causal regularity as Carnap says. Secondly, one of these particular norms is what Merleau-Ponty calls the norm of optimality. And when he says, you know, this, this kind of norm pertains to whether our sensorimotor sensor responses are organized in a sufficiently optimal way to engage smoothly with an action. So if a, if a person B successfully in an optimal way, for example, he moves a few steps back or flexes his neck or jumps, hence he avoids the incoming ball. We can, uh, so his, we can call his act as optimal or correct or incorrect, but it's, therefore it's not a purely causal regularity as Carnap says. Thirdly, I think it's obvious, you know, embedded action in the guise of ostensive acts are goal direct activity. You know, they try to achieve a goal. And in, in the case of person B, person B tries to avoid his face being smashed. That's his goal. He, didn't, he, didn't, he doesn't want his face to, to get smashed or his nose broken. Fourthly, you know, ostensive acts are characterized by a structural element of their fluidity. Merle Pondy talks about it. The fact that, you know, bodily movements are, are able to adjust flexibly into the variation in the circumstance without the help of reasoning, uh, conceptual reasoning or conceptualization. For example, person B, instead of, for example, this time, moving a few steps back, he tries to catch the ball this time. Hence, you know, this kind of, there's a new kind of act that's carried out by a new kind of ostensive manipulation of the object and without any help of, you know, conceptualization or conceptual reasoning. First, you know, when Carnap says it's, a, it's the formal properties of forms rather than meaning or content that should determine 
the structures that we want in our structural systems, I think you know he risks losing objectivity or friction, but frictional frictional content with the world. You know, but ostensive acts pay, uh, pay tribute to environmental constraints. You know, for example, it's, it's the shape of the ball that determines what kind of hand manipulations are possible when it comes to catching the ball. You know, the person B does not just randomly tries to catch the ball or uh, while sometimes contingently by random luck he, you know, catching the ball. But he's actually responding to the mass, volume, inertia, and structural resilience of the ball. Hence, these objective characteristics or objective content of the ball necessarily constrains our embodied acts of extension. When without having a conceptual understanding of what mass is, what volume is, what inertia is, what structural res resilience of the ball is. Uh, six, I think, you know, uh, reason, responsiveness of, of the station or, or embedded act, act is, is, is obvious. You know, you can have a knowledge, uh, previous propositional, know that knowledge that can inform your embedded action. Uh, you know, I, I, what I want to say, you know, the, what these six characteristics of ostensive act in, acts in the guise of um, embodied actions are fundamentally different from sense impressions. You know, sense impressions are not are purely causal; they are not reason responsive. So, when Karna confuses ostensive with you know, causal regularities, I think it's a fundamental mistake on his part. Uh, finally, this is the last slide. I will finish in a, in a, in a minute. Uh, I want to differentiate between inactive and conceptual structuration. Uh, and I want to do so in, with, help of, with the help of Sellers. You know, Sellers in his uh, phenomenal uh, paper, it's called Mental Events, I think it was published in 1981. He makes, he makes a useful distinction between the order of being and the order of knowing, you know, to, to elucidate the relationship between mind and language. He says, the best way to understand the relationship between mind and language is to understand the fact that mind comes first in the order of being, even if language comes first in first in the order of knowing. So mind comes second in the order of knowing, and language comes second in the order of being. I think we can use this distinction in favor of this approach. You know that we can say that inactive ostensive structuration of the environment comes first in the order of being, even if linguistic conceptual logical structuration comes first in the order of knowing. Secondly, I think the knowing part itself can be you know, divided or structured with itself. You know, we can say there's a hierarchy of extended priority that not all knowledge is just pure, know that propositional, logical, conceptual knowledge. Uh, and we can say that, you know, uh, embodied, act, embodied ostensive acts are some sort of know-how, non-propositional knowledge that come first before the, con the conceptual, explicit, logical uh, knowledge. Uh, now, I want to talk about you know, the myth of the given and the frictionless spinning of the world. I think if I have understood Karna's claim so far correctly in the Aufbau, I think Aufbau is bedeviled by two fundamental problems. Uh, because, you know, he, because uh, he, I think, I think, I, I'm not sure, but I think he depends on sense impressions and primary experiences as the fundamental units that we can uh, logically, uh, you know, abstract from. I think he's this approach is bedeviled by the myth of the given. And because the, the structures are purely logical, I think he's bedeviled again by the, the, you know, the problematic of frictionlessly spinning of the void. I, I don't have time to talk about the exact definitions of the myth of the given or frictionless spinning of the void, but I think Reza understands what I'm saying. Uh, yeah, I think my basic problematic is that, you know, you, you, I think the, 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 fun, the, fun, the foundational unit for Karna can be an ostensive, you know, ostensive embedded act, not a phenomenal sense impression or, uh, you know, the primary experiences because, because of these two problematics, the method of the given and the frictionless spinning of, in the void, in the void of logic. Thank you. Thank you, Dushad. Fantastic, excellent, excellent, superb. Uh, no, I mean, this is, this is more than what I needed uh, uh, or asked for, really. Uh, it's, there, there are really good uh, critiques here. Uh, 
Uh, first, I want to really thank for taking your time. Uh, even though I might disagree uh, on many points here, nevertheless, I appreciate uh, the amount of time and the amount of thinking that you have put on this. I, I really, I'm really, really surprised. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, I mean, I have, I have, look, look I mean,